So on November 12th of 2012, at around 2.30 a.m., a man by the name of Terry Porter was on his way home. And Terry Porter was somebody who was known in the community as quite the busy man. And he used the wealth that he accumulated with his own hard work to open up four assisted living homes in the west end of Atlanta, which at the time was a bit run down and the crime and the homelessness were up. So he was known in the community as a local hero. So on this night, he would be going home like any other regular night. However, once he got home, he would realize that there was somebody there waiting for him. And at around 6.45 a.m., police get a call saying that there is a man that is dead on his front lawn. So police arrive to the home and the man that is dead is Terry Porter. However, this shocked police initially because who would want this man dead? Everybody in this community loved him. Everybody knew who he was. Anybody that needed help, he was there. He had no enemies. So how did this happen? So Terry was the second oldest brother of five siblings. And he was always very ambitious. He was such a good kid, great role model. And from a young age, he just knew that he wanted to build a life for himself because he felt in his heart he had such a deep life purpose. Originally, he and his family were from Lake Charles in Louisiana. However, after college, after he graduated, he decided to move to Atlanta. And that's when he got into the real estate business. And quickly he started buying and flipping homes and he started gaining quite some wealth to him. And this was around the time where Atlanta, you know, it had a lot of history. A lot of the people that lived in that area in the 60s were a part of the civil rights movement. So this area had a lot of history. However, over the years, things kind of went downhill, drugs and crime went rapid, homelessness started increasing, and he felt like it was a part of his mission to help this community and bring it back to where it used to be. And that's exactly what he was doing. So in 2003, he ends up buying a home in a neighborhood that's up and coming, but yet still quite run down. You know, there's still a few abandoned homes and everything. However, he decides that he's going to renovate this new home and he's going to live there. And slowly but surely, he's going to start renovating more of the homes on the street. On November 12th of 2012, when police arrive to the scene and they see Terry Porter dead on his front lawn, they were shocked. Everybody knew who this man was, what he has done. And when they first arrived to the crime scene, they noticed that he was face down with a wound, a gunshot wound, from, starting from the back, entering, sorry, exiting out the front. And Terry is 6'7". He's a very tall man. So for this to have happened, they figured that he had to have been on his knees facing forward while the person who had the gun was behind him and it was a bit of like an execution style killing so they felt like was this personal like this is just an interesting way to do that however they did notice that his pockets were turned inside out his wallet was missing his car keys and his 2006 Range Rover was missing also. So they figured maybe it was just a robbery 
and whoever did this didn't really realize who they just murdered. It was just at random, but police didn't really know yet. So medical examiners determined that he had to have been there at, for a few hours. So they assumed that he was murdered at around 2.30 a.m. So news about this spread through the community very quickly, as you can assume. You know, everybody in the, communi in the community was devastated, shocked, and just heartbroken. And it wasn't just the police that were trying to figure out what happened. Everybody in the community wanted help. So police put up pictures of his missing car. They figured that's a place that they could start. If they find the car, then they could find maybe who has done this. So they post pictures. Everybody in the community is posting pictures everywhere. Everybody's talking to everyone. Hey, did you see or hear anything that night? And the police also went from neighbor to neighbor, asking around to see maybe he had an enemy. You know, when you are somebody that well known, it could happen. However, with every single person that the police talked to, they quickly learned that he had no enemies and it was quite the opposite. Everybody had such amazing things to say about him. There was, if anything, amazing stories about what he had done for them. And there was this one girl named Kelly and she said that, yeah, Terry helped me at one of the lowest points in my life. He saw that I was going to be homeless, I had a financial situation that was really bad, and he offered her a job at one of his nursing homes. And she was like, well, thank you, but I, I mean, I have no experience. And he was like, don't worry about it. He put her through nursing school so we could give her this job. So yeah, that just gives you a bit of an insight on how big his heart was and how caring he was to everybody in the community. So police end up noticing that his neighbor had a camera and it was pointing to his house. So they figured, well, let's check it out. Maybe we could see who was in it. However, this lead didn't do anything because it was a camera to kind of ward off people. It wasn't actually on. It just gave the illusion so people wouldn't do anything. So at this point, they're a little stumped. They don't really know what to do. They haven't heard anything from anyone yet. Until one day, they receive a tip from Terry's brother. And, you know, when Terry heard about this, he was devastated. So he just was thinking, 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 is there anything that I remember that could help with this case? And he remembered that there was an abandoned house across from where he lived and that there was homeless people living in there. And a few weeks back, he got into a fight or a dispute with one of them. So he figured, you know, maybe it could have been them. And he let the police know. So the police go to the abandoned home and there was nobody in there. There was signs that somebody used to live in there but it was empty and so they asked around the community of the homeless people in that area and none of them really knew anything none of them really said anything so again police are stumped so they decide to look more into his community work police found out that he mentored a lot of young people in the community you know not only was he helping older people that needed help, but he was helping the younger generation get back up on their feet and be a free mentor to give them a better life. So through all of their work, they have found nothing but basically good news about who he was, the relationships he's built, everything he's done. So they are still back at square one. They have no idea what to do. So they post his car on Crime Stoppers. There's like a television program, Crime Stoppers, where you can post things and hopefully you can get tips, phone call tips in. 
So that's what they did and they just prayed that something would come through. So November 15th, this is three days after Terry's murder, they actually get a tip from Crime Stoppers saying that they know where his 2006 Range Rover is and that it was found at the back of Darlington Apartments. So police rush over there and they talk to the management and they say, have you found anything? Was anything suspicious happening lately? And they didn't really have much to say about it. They didn't know who owned the vehicle, but they knew that it was there for three days. So police took the vehicle for further inspection, obviously. And the management just wasn't that much help. The cameras erased after 48 hours. So if anything was on camera, it would be gone by now. So not too long after, management from the Darlington Apartments calls the police and they say, I forgot to tell you, but I don't know how I didn't remember, but there was also a carjacking and there was somebody at this apartment asking about this carjacking and the vehicle was found at the Darlington Apartments as well. So police figured, okay, well maybe it's the same guy. There's two carjackings that were ended up finding at Darlington Apartments, so there has to be something going on. So they contact the investigator that was investigating that case. And when they talked to him, they found out that with this carjacking, the victim was on the payphone back towards the street and a man came up behind her with a gun told her to get on her knees, give him her wallet and her keys and everything that she has. And he took the car and drove off. And she was alive, she didn't get harmed. And then her, it was her car that was found at Darlington Apartments. And with the way Terry was murdered, it just felt very similar. And they figured that they probably are investigating the same guy. So the police in Terry's case end up talking to this victim and they ask her for the description because she saw him and she said that it was a light-skinned black male at around 20 to 25 years old. He was wearing a face covering. It was like mostly his eyes. Um, and she let them know that there was ATM transactions taken from her card that he stole from her. So that gives police some help where they can figure out, okay, what did he buy? Where did he buy it? Is there cameras where he bought these things? And they finally got somewhere in this case. They found video surveillance footage of him at an ATM machine withdrawing money out and there was a camera and you could see his face and it looked like the guy that she described. So they compare this with Terry's transactions. So after Terry was murdered, there was multiple um, bank transactions that were made under his name after he was murdered. So they do the same thing. They noticed that there was a purchase at Texaco gas station, so they looked at the surveillance footage there and exact same guy. So they now know, okay, so we have the guy. We just need to figure out who it is now. So police contact media to release how he looks like, if anyone can come forward and they know who he is. And they go to the victim, she confirms, yes, that was him in both of the pictures. And they also end up going to Darlington Apartments. And they ask, does he live here? Like, do you know this man at all? And the manager is like, yeah, that guy comes in quite regularly, actually. His name is Santana. Okay, like what unit? So they give him the unit and they go knocking on the door and a woman answers and they show her a picture and she says yeah that is Santana that is my boyfriend however she claims that she doesn't know his real name or where he is and police are like mm-hmm okay 
So they decide to ask her a few more questions, see if she would say anything else. And they asked her about the car. Has he, you know, picked you up in a black Range Rover at all lately? Oh, yeah, he, he picked me up in one not too long ago. Why? Oh, we're investigating a murder and a carjacking. And that was the vehicle that was stolen. She's like, oh, no, like, am I going gonna, gonna, to gonna get in trouble? Like, I didn't know. And they were like, no, no, it's fine. However... Can we search your apartment, you know, see if there's anything in there that could help us? So she agrees and they get the warrant and they search her apartment. And that's when they find a few things in there that were missing from his vehicle. So they took the items for DNA testing and that's when they have to wait and wait for results to come in. So on November 26th, that's when police finally get a break in this case. And they get a call from a lady that saw his face on media and let them know, like, that man, his name is Ladarius. Ladarius Hardy. So they look into Ladarius Hardy and there it is, multiple crimes. There's carjackings, aggravated assault, other petty crimes and they're able to get his address now. So they go to his address and again, a woman answers and they claim, do you know Ladarius Hardy? Oh yeah, that's my ex-boyfriend. I haven't seen him in eight months though. Okay, so we're back to square one. However, when they show her the photos that they got from the surveillance footage, she confirms like, yes, that is Ladarius. So they figure, well, maybe he's on the run, maybe he saw his face on the news. And so they look at all the credit card transactions under Terry's name to try to see if they could paint a picture of where he might be. And they find that he basically went on a shopping spree. There were 30 to 40 transactions and he used over $1,600. And this is still only a few days after he was murdered. But the thing is, is why would he murder him? You know, like if he has a history of carjacking, why murder Terry at this time? So police end up getting an arrest warrant out for him. And that's when the fugitive task force is now going to locate and hunt for this guy because they feel that he's a danger to society and that he could very easily kill again. So they were on it. So the task force are able to get a lineup and the police take the picture of the lineup of suspects and ask the girlfriend, his Ladarius's current girlfriend, do you recognize any of these people? She claims she doesn't recognize any of them and she claims that she hasn't heard or talked to him and she was just being very uncooperative. She just wouldn't help the police at all. So that's when they decide to take her in for further interviewing. And they ask her more questions and she just doesn't want to tell them anything. She's no help. She's extremely uncooperative. And if anything, she's kind of sassy and like dismissive towards them. They let her know we can arrest you for having items of a murdered man who had his things stolen and they were in your possession in your apartment. And she was like, well, what do you mean? I didn't take them. That doesn't matter. If it's in your possession and it is stolen property, you can get arrested for it. So start talking. So after they basically threaten her with the fact that they can arrest her and they're being nice about it and they haven't done that she finally decides to start talking and she points out which one Ladarius is in the lineup and she also let police know that Ladarius did call her before they arrived to her place and told her to keep quiet and not tell them anything and she also gives the police his phone number so when they track his phone number they find that he is staying at his girlfriend's mother's house. So they all go there ready to arrest him. And when they go in there, they find more things that belong to Terry. They found his keys, 
they found guns, and they finally place him in custody. And it's been about one month since Terry's murder. So after taking him into custody, they interview him, and he claims that he knew Terry before the robbery. However, he did not murder him. And he said that Terry actually mentored him and he was helping him try to live a better life. This man that murdered him was one of the kids that Terry was mentoring. So why would he want to kill him? So he tells police, it wasn't me, like I knew somebody who, I knew somebody who robbed and took his car, but I didn't know he killed him. That was his first story. And then his second story was, okay, well, I actually knew that they were gonna mur that they were gonna rob him, sorry. But I didn't know that they were gonna murder him. So at this point, he is claiming that he did not kill him. There is no, he has no relation to his murder. However, he has relation to the robbery part. And they let him know, like, hey, we have so much evidence, so much surveillance evidence of you doing financial fraud, you using his credit card, his money, everything. However, police have enough evidence and they charge him with murder, robbery, assault, financial fraud, all of it, everything. And due to the death of Terry being execution style, his... His case never went to trial, and he was sentenced to the death penalty. However, if he pled guilty, he wouldn't get the death penalty. So Ladarius ends up claiming guilty, and he gets two life sentences without parole. Ladarius killed Terry out of envy. Terry had a life that Ladarius wanted, and Terry was trying to help Ladarius get that lifestyle and he ended up repaying Terry by murdering him. It was personal. Terry was helpless. There was no reason for Ladarius to kill him because <clears throat> Terry would have helped Ladarius in any way. Ladarius just wanted his lifestyle and it wasn't coming fast enough, so he decided to kill Terry and basically steal his lifestyle steal his car, steal his credit cards. So the community all got together. There was so many people there. They held vigils, candlelight vigils, and the whole community mourned his death. 10 years after his death even, people are still impacted about his death in the community. Thousands were greatly impacted by his work and who knows how many more people he would have helped if he was still alive to this day. And everybody in the community knows that he would have helped people till the day he died, which is what he did. Sadly, it came sooner than everybody wanted it to. So that's everything I have for this case. Thank you for watching and bye.